We're, uh, we're glad to have you each joining us for uh, tonight's introductory meeting. And uh, we're going to talk about some things that I think are especially exciting. We're glad for each one of you who uh, has come to join us either on Zoom or on um, actually other platforms. So we're up on Facebook and we are on YouTube as well. So I am right now in Fort Wayne, Indiana. I know there's folks joining us from elsewhere, but this is it was designed originally especially for folks in Fort Wayne. Do not uh, feel that you're not welcome if you're visiting us or joining us from so somewhere outside the area. We are actually looking at, I think, some incredibly amazing and incredibly encouraging topics. For those of you who don't know me, I am a, a physician, David DeRose, and uh, I will go ahead and project things for you right now so you can um, see my credentials and also a way to get a hold of me if you would like. So those of you that need to reach me, you can see an email address right there. So we want to talk tonight about something that can help you turn back the clock by optimizing what we call blood fluidity. Some of you may have heard me in the past speak about this topic, it's called hemorrheology. And I'm just gonna give you a quick overview and then we're gonna have a poll for you. It'll let me know who all we've got here with us. So um, we are going to um, talk about blood fluidity, hemorrheology. And uh, hemo of course comes from the root meaning blood. And then rheology has to do with the science dealing with the flow properties of complex substances, fluids, or matter. And hemorrheology is literally the science of blood fluidity. And uh, really, you can say this is a science that is at the heart of keeping you healthy. If you look at scientific research on hemorrheology or blood fluidity, you find some profound things. Uh, years ago, someone spoke about hemorrheology and um, they said uh, perfect health depends on perfect circulation. Perfect health depends on perfect circulation. Um, I think it's kind of a, an interesting concept and we're really finding that medical science is supporting this. Uh, a while back, actually in just last year, I came out with a book called The Methuselah Factor uh, just looked a little bit earlier today. It's uh, doing well as uh, one of the preventive medicine titles on Amazon. It's number 20 among uh, the Kindle preventive medicine titles. It's also available in, in soft cover and audiobook. And it's, uh, it's tracking really well. People like the book. It's making a difference. And tonight and in subsequent uh, health segments, we're going to go through practical things from this book. We've come out with a series of new videos that I'll be showing you. And uh, we'll start doing that this evening. So we're going to move to a poll at this point. So we've got it. It's a two question poll. Have you read all or part of my book, The Methuselah Factor? And then have you seen any of my missing link videos? So I see a number of you responding. OK, good. Thank you. We're going to close it here in about 10 seconds. And then I'll show you the responses. So we're just closing the poll here. Okay, so we're gonna end the polling. Okay, we're gonna share the results with you. So just so you know, if you said you've read some or part of the Methuselah Factor book, you're uh, like half the participants. If you haven't, you're like the other half. And it seems that most of you have not seen any of our missing link videos. Now, I'm sorry for those of you watching on Facebook or YouTube, only if you're on Zoom can you actually interact and do some of the interactive functions. But uh, we appreciate those of you who are on Zoom giving us some feedback. So we're gonna move on and uh, talk about why hemorrheology, why blood fluidity is so important. And I'll tell you about some things that you can do to connect with this material between now and our next session that will take place on uh, Tuesday the 9th, Tuesday the 9th. So medical research has shown all kinds of connections between this uh, Methuselah factor. It's my term for hemorrheology. I call it the Methuselah factor because uh, there was a character in history who was reputedly the longest lived person on the planet. 
and uh, that individual was named Methuselah. So I want to show you a few things that uh, the medical science is showing about this important science of blood fluidity. Uh, let me just give you the example of stroke. So uh, stroke is, um, of course, a leading cause of death, and uh, it's something that uh, has been connected with blood fluidity. That may not seem surprising, but in this 2004 study, they looked at a number of markers of blood fluidity. Hematocrit, that's the percentage of your blood that's made up of red blood cells. They looked at viscosity, that's a, a measure of blood thickness. And then the tendency of your red blood cells to clump, as well as a clotting protein called fibrinogen. All of these things are determinants of blood fluidity. The worse they were, the more strokes a person had, or the more likely they were to have a stroke. You say, okay, well, that's pretty obvious. How important are these risk factors? Well, let me illustrate this for you with uh, coronary artery disease, uh, the cause of heart attacks. And this is looking at some of these same uh, Methuselah factor components, these same determinants of blood fluidity. And what I want you to notice with things like fibrinogen, this clotting protein or viscosity, it can increase your risk of a heart attack some fourfold. So this Methuselah factor that we're gonna study, we're gonna show you how you can improve your blood fluidity. It's gonna be very practical. T tonight, I'm just giving you a little bit of the background. And uh, what we're gonna do to make this even more practical is tell you this, and that is that these factors are not only important for uh, things like preventing stroke and heart attack, but they can help your mental and physical performance. This is another graphic from my book, The Methuselah Factor. And it's showing you in athletes, highly trained athletes, how if they improve their blood fluidity, they had more muscle strength, they had better working capacity, better fitness measurements. And so really, if you wanna perform better physically and mentally, you wanna optimize your Methuselah factor. So it can do all these things, you see them listed there. We will be, um, we are recording these presentations and we'll put it, uh, put it uh, up there for you. Um, uh, after the program, we'll send it. If we have your email, uh, we'll send this out to you. So uh, make sure you uh, know, let us know how we can connect with you, okay? So let me go ahead now and tell you, we're gonna let you uh, have an assignment between now and our first official start. This is an introductory meeting where I was giving people an overview. We're glad that you've come. Um, two weeks from tonight, we'll actually be launching the program where we give you a pointer or several pointers every week to improve your blood fluidity, improve your overall health. And uh, we've got an assignment. Victor's gonna put this um, link in the chat section of Zoom. If you're not watching on Zoom, um, probably the easiest thing is just to go to Compass Health Consulting, Compass Health Space Consulting on YouTube. And uh, we're gonna be showing you some videos over the course of um, this series. And tonight we're going to do that. We're gonna show you one of these uh, missing link videos. Um, it's based on one of the emerging connections between um, COVID-19 and blood fluidity. If you haven't heard the name of Dr. Schwelt, um, he's uh, one of the leading YouTubers, physician who's actually treating COVID-19. And he's talking right now, I just looked at his most recent YouTube video, uh, talking about how uh, really, it, the Methuselah factor, he didn't use that term, but blood fluidity and clotting is uh, responsible for some of the complications of COVID-19. So if you want to have less severe COVID-19 infection, you want to have good blood fluidity. We're going to um, right now show you a video, and uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and one of my associates is going to um, actually show you uh, this video right now. So it's one of the series called The Missing Link, uh, videos that are showing the importance of the Methuselah factor. Is there a missing link when it comes to preventing the ravages of COVID-19, when it comes to yourself and to those you love? I'm Dr. David DeRose, and the research is suggesting that there might be something that's not often in the dialogue that can make a big difference. I'm speaking about the subject of hemorrheology. Now you say, no, I haven't heard anyone talking about hemorrheology when it comes to COVID-19. Well, some of you may know, I wrote a book not all that long ago called The Methuselah Factor. It is making this uh, very complex science of hemorrheology practical. 
it's focused on what you can do to improve your blood fluidity. And if you've been keeping track of developments with COVID-19, what we once as a medical community thought was primarily a respiratory virus, we now realize has profound effects on the circulatory system. We've got young children that are suffering from vascular problems, we call it vasculitis. We have people in middle age who are having strokes. We have older people who are showing evidence of what we call thromboses. Some of them are large clots that may be affecting their lungs. We call them pulmonary emboli or smaller clots in other blood vessels. Many researchers are finding that part of the ravages that's caused by COVID-19 is exactly because of blood fluidity. So, although we don't have all the dots connected, it seems prudent to do whatever we can to improve our circulatory health if we want to avoid the ravages of COVID-19 and a host of other problems. You say, well, I've been hearing some things about this, what can I do? Well, I'd like to suggest to you that if you get focused on a program to improve your Methuselah factor, your blood fluidity, even if it never turns out that any of the evidence connects this seamlessly with COVID-19 and its complications, the research shows that you're gonna be putting yourself in a powerful position to decrease your risk of things like stroke and heart attack and even certain types of cancer. What I'm trying to say is that there's a missing link when it may come to the immune system and common viruses like COVID-19. Some of these things also have a relationship to our circulatory health. And the message is, if you can improve your blood fluidity, it can pay you big dividends. But I don't wanna just give you a general overarching solution without giving you some practical strategies. So let me give you three. Three simple things you can do to improve your Methuselah factor. The first one is simply drink more water. Just a couple days ago, someone gave me a call and they were talking to me about their blood work. They described a situation where one of their kidney tests, we call it BUN, was quite high, but another kidney test called creatinine was quite low. They were wondering what was going on. I told them that the most common scenario where I see this pattern is simply not drinking enough water. If you're not drinking enough water, your circulatory health is not as good as it could be. And by the way, if we're thinking about the immune system, one of your first lines of defense, not even affecting your immune cells, is your respiratory tract, your respiratory tree. Did you know that you have mucus and little hairs lining your airways? We call it the mucociliary blanket. If that's operating effectively and you inhale some germs, that blanket can move those germs out of harm's way out of the lungs, into the mouth. We either cough them up or swallow them into the acid environment of the stomach. My point is simply this, keeping well hydrated, good for your circulation and good for your immune defenses. A second thing you can do is get regular physical activity. Regular physical activity is a powerful boon to having optimal circulatory health. If you're interested in having good blood fluidity, you've got to emphasize regular physical activity. You're worried about doing too much? Sure, check with a health professional if you've got concerns about your heart or blood vessels, but the bottom line is regular physical activity at an appropriate level is good for everyone. And then the third thing is focus on a healthy diet. There's some things that I talk about in the Methuselah Factor book that are just losers. One of them is those simple sugars. Yeah, that's right. Refined sugars, whether they're in soft drinks, whether they're in desserts, these things are not helping your immune system and they are not helping your circulatory health. Instead, choose whole plant foods, more whole grains, more vegetables, more fruits, more beans, more seeds. These are the winners. Is there a missing link when it comes to COVID-19? Perhaps. The Methuselah factor may make a profound difference, Good blood fluidity may help you to avoid some of the ravages of COVID-19. Can I prove it? Well, no, but what have you got to lose? You stand to lower your blood pressure, improve your diabetes, lose weight, and you guessed it, all those things are associated with worse outcomes if you've got COVID-19. So improve the blood pressure, improve the blood sugar, 
drop some pounds, and you'll be in better shape. That's what the evidence suggests if you can track COVID-19. All of that and more is what the Methuselah factor is about. It is a missing link. Put it into practice in your own life. Share it with others. It could make all the difference. So basically, what, uh, what you'll be able to do if you uh, go to my YouTube channel, it's simply Compass Health is one word, space consulting. If you go to that YouTube channel, you'll see a section of videos. We have like nine of them up right now. They're called The Missing Link. What we're showing is how this Methuselah factor, why it's so important. And um, that's really your assignment between now and two weeks from now. I want you to to really, uh, if you look here where we're going, we're gonna be going through simple health principles to improve your health. But I want you to say, well, this really does make sense. I see why this guy, why this doctor is uh, saying, okay, um, why does he want us to improve our blood fluidity? So if you watch some of those videos between now and two weeks from today on June 9th, uh, you'll, be up to speed why I'm going through simple principles to improve your blood fluidity because it can help you in all these variety of ways. So Victor has put up this uh, this link if you're on Zoom. If, um, if you're not on Zoom, you could take a screenshot, but e really the easiest thing to do instead of trying to key in all these uh, uh, this code is just to go to YouTube and put in simply uh, Compass Health Space Consulting and just subscribe to the channel then I'll be putting out a couple more videos in that series during the next two weeks. So uh, you'll be have access to all those videos. And then Victor also handles the resources. So those of you um, tuning in, um, you can take advantage of the 50% off if you do want a print copy of the book, but you do not need that. But that's just uh, something we're offering you, okay? So um, make sure that you uh, subscribe to the channel. Whether you come to these Tuesday night meetings or not, we're gonna be releasing um, 30 new videos. They're gonna come out in a DVD uh, set, should be coming out in about a month, but you'll be able to see them first. So no one's seen these videos publicly. It's just the creative folks who've been working on them. So we're gonna be rolling these out over starting on June 9, you'll be seeing some of these new videos uh, we'll have hopefully the kinks worked out so that we can show them for you and um, and you'll get to to watch them. If you're subscribed to the channel, you'll get to see them as well. Um, but we'll have an interactive component in these uh, in these meetings, okay? So an added bonus, uh, I promise this to you as we're winding up the uh, the health portion. As you can see here, we have a special uh, a book. This is a book I wrote about, oh, four years ago, four to six years ago, when the Ebola crisis was upon us. And uh, if you wanna get a free copy of the book, Evading Ebola, you can just log into compasshealth.net slash Ebola, or you can uh, send me an email, David DeRose at hopeawakens.com, and we will give you that, uh, that free book, okay? I've got some other free resources I'll tell you about in just a minute. So we're gonna segue from the health segment now to a spiritual component. Now, don't just leave. Some of you will not want the spiritual component, and that's fine, but I wanna tell you about why I've included it in this series, and uh, it's, uh, we're calling it uh, Hope Awakens, based on an inspiring uh, series that some of us have watched recently, and uh, I work with the Hope Awakens team. I'm one of their volunteer coordinators in uh, the Fort Wayne area. But let me tell you, just stay with me for about 10 minutes, and uh, check this out, even if you don't think you're interested in the spiritual component. I wanna tell you why I've included it. So I've asked you to stay by at least for my overview, because I've got some other free resources you could take advantage of, even if you say, hey, I'd like to come Tuesday nights because we'll be screening some new videos, and then we'll also have an interactive component where uh, we're gonna be talking about maybe some challenges that some folks may wanna share some of their health journey. If you don't wanna do that, that's fine but I know some folks have told me they wanna connect with other people as they're making changes in their lifestyle. We'll have things that we will not have on my YouTube channel that we'll also planning to show, some cooking videos and things, demonstrations that can help you. 
So um, one of the reasons we're doing the spiritual component is because what we're finding when it comes to um, when it comes to stress, when it comes to immune functioning, when it comes to Methuselah factor, is people today are having real challenges when it comes to optimally controlling their stress. And if you don't control your stress well, your immune system won't function as well, a big concern today, and your blood fluidity will be worse. Let me just take a minute and show you just a little, just one example of the medical research. So this is kind of interesting, how they, they induce stress in a laboratory. One of the ways they do it is they show stressful videos. And you may find this, uh, uh, well, somewhat unsettling. But much of what is watched on um, conventional uh, internet, television, film, is actually stress-inducing. So it may help you forget your problems, but it actually could still be raising your stress hormone levels. Anyway, in this study, that's what they did. They showed a stress-inducing video, and what they found is, guess what? Their blood fluidity got worse. And uh, you say, okay, well, fair enough. This is not all bad. Think about it. If, uh, if a tiger jumps out from the bushes, fortunately, you know, we don't have tigers in, in Fort Wayne, Indiana. But if one did jump out of the bushes, I would want my heart rate to go up, my blood pressure to go up, and my blood to be more coagulable. Because in, if I had to wrestle that tiger and he inflicted wounds, I'd want the bleeding to stop as quickly as possible. So uh, this is not some mistake in the human physiology, this is good. You want your blood to be more coagulable when you're in that fight or flight mode. The problem is we trigger the fight or flight mode when we watch the news, when we drive in traffic, when uh, you get the picture, right? So uh, elevated stress hormone levels in the short term and also in the long term worsen blood fluidity and then chronically elevated stress hormone levels actually impair our immune functioning. So this is a really big concern today. And so the things that we're gonna be talking about in the health segment, the first 20 minutes of our time together each Tuesday, starting June 9, is gonna help with your blood fluidity. But the spiritual component, I'm including it, why? Because the evidence suggests there's some spiritual connections with stress control. Because when it comes to dealing with stressors, I've noticed over the years, many people tell me that they say, the Bible for them is a great stress relieving agency. Now, other people might say it's stress inducing. And uh, you might say, well, okay, who cares if someone says it's stress relieving? Does that really mean that it is? Well, let me show you something, why I've included this. Now, there's a number of reasons. Some of you have engaged with the uh, Hope Awakens meetings. These are meetings that just concluded. Some of you recognize this gentleman, Pastor John Bradshaw. He's an internationally known uh, host of the program, It Is Written. And some of you have come to this session because uh, to be honest with you, uh, I was inspired by these meetings and other people in Fort Wayne. And we said, we should do something that continues the influence of these meetings. And what I liked about what Pastor Bradshaw did is he took solid science, he, he interviewed uh, many health professionals. Some of you, if you watch the series, he even interviewed me one night. And he included Bible principles to try to help people have more hope and uh, deal with stress. And I thought it was very effective. So um, these Tuesday meetings that we're having, that we're launching tonight with this introductory meeting, were originally designed as a follow-up for the Hope Awakens series. And uh, the idea was that I would, in this spiritual component, build on Pastor Bradshaw's meetings. If you've watched them all, you might say, well, you know, why would I want some physician to go over them again? Because I'm going to not just uh, review what Pastor Bradshaw said, I'll be giving additional content, additional perspective. And as we get into the series, we'll have opportunities for interaction. And, and you'll see that tonight as we, we move into that portion. But I've asked you to, you know, all of you to stay by for just a few more minutes. But let me just tell you a few more reasons, tell you about two few resources. Then if you want to jump off, uh, you know, great. If you say, I just want the health component. I don't want the spiritual dimension. You know, I respect your decision. But just personal way of reference. Uh, as a young adult, I was an agnostic. I thought a lot of the spiritual stuff was just frankly kind of a bunch of nonsense, bunch of stories and fables. 
Um, I felt I was a pretty high stress person at that uh, time in my in my life. Over a course of um, of time, I started looking at some of the very things that uh, Pastor Bradshaw shared and that we'll be looking at. And I said, you know what? I can't just uh, say the Bible's a fairy tale. There's something more here that I've got to look at it. And as I looked at it, I found some compelling things that have been helpful to me in my own life in dealing with stress and having hope and having a positive outlook. So um, that's just kind of a personal note on why this is of significance to me. And I'm convinced that regardless of what your spiritual persuasion is, regardless of what your background is, whether you like, I used to consider myself an agnostic or an atheist, or whether you're uh, from another faith tradition, you don't really think the Bible is anything special, maybe an in interesting uh, history book. Um, regardless of what your spiritual persuasion is, I think we're going to find some things that are really encouraging, and you'll see that tonight. And um, here's what I want to share with you. This is kind of a bridge. This is not this builds on material that Pastor Bradshaw shared, and I'm going to give you a few of these uh, medical points. Then we'll tell you the, the two free resources, two free additional resources. And then when I go into the actual more spiritual content, uh, those of you that say, hey, DeRose, I heard enough. Uh, that was a bit for me tonight. I hung in there. Uh, and I, I give you all credit for that. But let me just share with you. The medical science really supports a connection between spirituality and health. Uh, our best-selling book ever that I've been involved with is something called 30 Days to Natural B Blood Pressure Control. And uh, we took a section in there to look at uh, the science on spirituality and health. One of my co-authors and I, a uh, guy by the name of Dr. Greg Steinke, we came out with a video series based on this. But I'm gonna give you about four slides from the book and this video that, uh, that just looked at how powerful spirituality was. This is uh, uh, research studies. This is published in a neurology journal. Uh, looking at what happens when people invest in their spiritual health. And they find that if you do that, you're more likely to stick with other health promoting behaviors. So, so just stop for a minute, think about this. The first 20 minutes of each of these presentations, like we did tonight, is focused on physical health. We're gonna go through things that can improve your Methuselah factor, your blood fluidity. And I'm looking at the scientific data and they say, if I help people connect with their spiritual dimension, they're gonna have better success in making lifestyle changes. So this is helping you see why for me as a physician, I wanted to include a spiritual component as well. It's optional, but uh, I want you to kind of see through my eyes as to why I think this is significant. Better physical functioning in people that prioritize spiritual health, improved quality of life, better mental health outcomes, more rapid and complete resolution of grief, Fewer hospitalizations. If you end up in the hospital, you're likely to be there a shorter period of time. You'll have less high blood pressure. That's why we included it in our book about high blood pressure. Just compelling data. If you got problems with your blood pressure and you think you're not a spiritual person, what we're saying is, hey, look at the spiritual dimension. It includes things like forgiveness and humility and other things. You don't have to be a member of a church to cultivate your spirituality. Uh, less cardiovascular disease, and a longer lifespan. So if you want to dig deeper into the spiritual content and you don't want to hang out with us for it, uh, hopeawakens.com or hopeawakens.org, but you want to select previous presentations. And uh, what I'm going to talk with you about tonight is uh, based on the first two presentations, uh, part one and part two from John Bradshaw's Hope Awakens series. What I'm going to share with you tonight, you'll say, well, this is pretty different but you'll see how it uh, complements some of the material that Pastor Bradshaw shared. And then on June 9th, I'll continue to build on some of the things that are in these first two presentations. So if you wanna go deeper into the spiritual component, uh, go to hopeawakens.com or hopeawakens.org and watch part one and part two. If you've already watched them like I have, you might wanna review them over the next couple of weeks and then we'll come back together and uh, I'll, I'll build on his presentation. So that's what we're doing tonight. So this is uh, my concluding slide for those of you who wanted to jump off. I encourage you just to stay by. So these are the final two free resources. Um, so I've got a paper that I put together that looks at how the Bible and science go together when it comes to the immune system. And I use a mnemonic called sanctuary. We talk about a, a biblical concept called a sanctuary. But sanctuary is something, you know, that's used outside of the spiritual realm. You know, we talk about uh, wildlife sanctuaries. 
Uh, it's a place of safety for wildlife, right? Or you talk about sanctuary cities. We could have a political, uh, uh, political discussion about whether you like or whether you don't like sanctuary cities. But uh, sanctuary is a place of refuge. And uh, compasshealth.net slash sanctuary, if you go there, you can get a, a free resource. It will also automatically uh, put you in our mailing list. So we'll let you know uh, about the resources. So any of you, I see some of you, you know, texting me in real time, and that's great. Uh, but if I have your email, I'm gonna send out a link to uh, where you can watch the videos, where you can watch this archive video if you haven't been with us from the you know, beginning. And uh, if you know people you want to invite, you want to bring them up to speed in this introductory session, do that. Or you can just email me straight out, David DeRose at hopeawakens.com. Uh, we're also sending out, if you ask for it, uh, Pastor Bradshaw's book, Promises of Power. A lot of his resources you can get online, but this is one of them that uh, for some of us who worked with the meetings, this was uh, something we have access to share with participants. So um, send me an email, David DeRose at hopeawakens.com, and I can get you that Promises of Power free ebook. Okay, so we're, this is the spiritual portion. We've covered the first uh, you know, 10 or 15 minutes you hung with me, those of you that I encourage you to stay by. Now we're gonna actually go into the, uh, the, the content of the spiritual dimension. And uh, if you just wanted to be here for the health component, great. Uh, we'll, we'll see you in two weeks for the first 20 minutes. We're going to be uh, introducing you to some new videos. They'll be premiered uh, either at that meeting in real time or, or just right around that time, some new videos that I'm uh, uh, releasing. So uh, join us at 7 p.m. on June 9th. But now let's uh, transition to the, uh, the spiritual dimension of, uh, of Hope Awakens. And this is based on uh, part one and part two of Pastor Bradshaw's uh, program. And uh, we are going to look at uh, some of the material he introduced us to. In his first presentation, he talked about signs. Do you know what they mean? And uh, most of the signs I did pretty well with. You probably did too, if you remember that presentation. But uh, one of them I didn't know about was uh, this, that if you have an exit notice on the right side of a sign, it actually means that the exit is gonna be on the right side of the road. You say, oh, okay, well, maybe that's pretty obvious. How about if it's on the other side? What would that indicate? Yes, an exit notice on the left side of the sign indicates the exit is on the left side of the road. So signs have a meaning and they, they cue us as to what's coming. And uh, Pastor Bradshaw's first presentation was on signs, We'll talk about some of those concepts uh, and interact with them a little bit uh, next uh, presentation as well on June 9. But um, one of his other illustrations I thought was profound. He, he told that story of an Amtrak engineer. This is not an isolated story. Uh, engineers have done this on more than one occasion. They miss a sign to slow down. And this particular engineer tried to make a 30 mile per hour turn at 80. Of course, the results were catastrophic, many injuries and deaths. So here's the question though. Signs provide reliable evidence of what's before us if the sign is reliable, if it's legitimate, right? So uh, that conductor, that engineer would have um, been spared terrible tragedy had he heeded the sign. But you could say, well, how do I know the signs or the purported signs or the alleged signs are legitimate? In antiquity, you may know there was this uh, practice where enemies or robbers would put up false signs. Imagine you're walking between cities and a thief changes the sign and directs you to some place where he's waiting to rob you. Not nice. So more to our point, we're speaking about the spiritual dimension and especially about biblical aspects. When the Bible speaks about signs, can we evaluate whether they're true or false? I mean, a lot of people like me, early in my life, I said, you know, a bunch of not just a bunch of storybooks, uh, stories in this, in this book uh, called the Bible. Well, let's look at these uh, questions. How can we know? How can we uh, have some insight? 
Now, this is really interesting. From my vantage point today, I, I really see evidence that the Bible is actually trustworthy. Now, I say that with some trepidation, not knowing who's listening. I don't want to put any individual in a bad light, but I think there's all kinds of people out there that draw conclusions they say are drawn from the Bible that I would say are anything but biblical, and they make the Bible and they make Christians look um, pretty ridiculous. And so if you're tuning in tonight and you feel you're an atheist or agnostic, um, that may be something um, that's commendable. Now, I know others, if you're you know, from a Christian worldview, you say, why would I commend an atheist or an agnostic? And the reason I commend some of these people is because some of the stuff they've been told is in the Bible or that Christians believe is really pretty ridiculous. It's not biblical. And uh, if you didn't watch Pastor Bradshaw's meetings, we're going to be looking at a number of these things, the myths that he dispelled in the series that really, I think, um, need wider circulation. And uh, for me, before I became a Christian, I thought this, a lot of this stuff was nonsense. I heard about it in churches, okay? And uh, now I realize that this stuff is not sound at all. So we're going to walk through a number of these things. So I want to show you in our time together, especially over these first two weeks, the Bible's stories are set in a scientifically defensible framework. We're going to look at that tonight from a physician's perspective. We're going to show you that the scriptural narratives are also, also set in a historically defensible context. It's not just made up. The Bible has, uh, there's historical evidence that shows the Bible is actually trustworthy. And then the Bible speaks of future events with stunning accuracy. That's, we're going to try to cover all those things in our uh, tonight and then uh, in our presentation two weeks from now. So just to full disclosure, tonight we're going to focus on this, the scientific aspect. And this is not really stuff that Pastor Bradshaw dealt with, but I think it's really important because it it feeds right into topics that he covered in his first two presentations. So we're going to look together now at the first chapter of the book of Daniel. And I would suggest to you from a physician standpoint, it's really focused on health and wellness. And it's really something important in the midst, I would say, of a toxic culture. Our, our culture today has become more and more toxic, the kind of rhetoric we hear, the kind of dialogue or lack of dialogue that's taking place. And I want to give you some really uh, practical things tonight. So you may not realize this, but the first chapter of the book of Daniel contains a scientific health study. Uh, this was fascinating. Back some years ago, uh, you're looking at this uh, uh, actual title page from the New England Journal of Medicine, one of the most prestigious medical journals in the world. Back in January of 2003, there was a dialogue going back and forth in the letters to the editor of the New England Journal of Medicine. And the dialogue was about this. What was the first medical study? What was the first clinical study? What evidence is there in history of the first medical study? And these uh, people were writing back and forth. They had smallpox studies, studies of scurvy. But uh, here was the uh, kind of final salvo in the dialogue. The earliest clinical trial was neither Watson's study of smallpox nor Lynn's study of the prevention of scurvy, the first report of a clinical trial has biblical origins in the book of Daniel. And then the, uh, the other author who was in dialogue said, I acknowledge Dr. Lewis's successful search for an earlier clinical trial, one that was performed a couple of thousand years ago and described in the book of Daniel. So tonight, in the time remaining to us, we wanna look at Daniel chapter one. And I do believe that uh, there is a God who wants to guide us as we study the Bible. So let's uh, just have a brief prayer together. Father in heaven, we're uh, looking at the Bible. Some might be uh, joining out of curiosity. Others might be uh, uh, ones who already have a relationship with you. They trust you. Whatever our perspective is tonight, please open our minds as we engage with the scriptures and help us to see the connection with science as well. We ask in your holy name, amen. So let's look at uh, the account in Daniel chapter one. It begins this way. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. 
And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the articles of the house of God, and he carried them into the land of Shinar to the house of his God, and he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. Now, what's really interesting about what's happening here, if you know anything about ancient history, and I'm not going to go through all these uh, slides for the interest of time, but since it's being recorded, if you want to uh, look at the recording and go back and look at some of them, but what's actually happening is Nebuchadnezzar, who was the most powerful potentate on the planet in the days of Daniel, is basically defiling the holy sanctuary of the Hebrew people. He has gone into that temple. He has uh, treated that which is holy as common. And uh, he's taken out these holy articles. And basically what this conveyed in the ancient world was that uh, the God of the Hebrew people, the God of the Bible, we could say, the God of the Old Testament, we might say today, uh, looked impotent, and the God of the Babylonians was superior. That, that's how the ancients viewed it. Whoever went, won a battle, their God was superior. And so the temple is defiled. That which is holy is treated as common. From a human perspective, the God of the Bible, irrelevant. Now, by the way, this is the way a lot of people feel today, okay? So it's an interesting story. Well, just watch what plays out. Some of you know the story very well. This is Daniel chapter 1, continuing the king. King Nebuchadnezzar has Ashpenaz, his chief official, to select from those Israelite exiles some young men of the royal family, and he actually brings them into a special training program. There were certain qualifications. They had to be handsome, intelligent, well-trained. They had to be quick to learn, have a high aptitude. What was going to happen here is Nebuchadnezzar he had an amazing policy. He would take captives who were in the royal line of the countries he had conquered, and he would train them. He would train them to be puppet rulers. So that's what happens in this story. Daniel and three of his friends are among that number, and it says the king then gives orders that every day these individuals were to give the fine, be given the finest food and beverages. They're going to be on this regimen for three years. They were going to be fed from the king's table, the same food and wine as the members of the royal court. You'd say, wow, they've arrived, right? Now, verse 6 mentions Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah as three Hebrews from the tribe of Judah, who were actually among this group that was going to receive the special training. And they were given new names. Very interesting. We don't have a lot of time to dwell on this. But these names, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, if you look at their names, all of them have either L or Ya. You see like A-H or E-L in their name. This, these names are derived from something to do with God. So Daniel would mean like God is my judge. So it, referring to the God of the Hebrews. So Nebuchadnezzar gives them all heathen names, names that go along with the Babylonian gods. So their names are changed. It's a part of a brainwashing process. They're going to learn the language of the Babylonians. They're being given the food of the Babylonians. Now this is where it gets really interesting. And it says, Daniel resolves that he's not going to defile himself with the royal rations of food and wine. Now, it's really interesting. So Daniel is basically saying that even though his senses would tell him that God is irrelevant and the things that are holy to God are not significant, the God of the Bible, he's still saying, even though it doesn't look that way, I am going to still trust the God of heaven, the God who revealed himself in the scriptures. And uh, according to the scriptures, there were certain things that you shouldn't eat or drink. And he says, I'm not going to defile myself. And so he asks Ashpenaz to allow him to follow his dietary convictions. Now, Ashpenaz is sympathetic to Daniel, but he's afraid. Because the king is offering Daniel and his friends the best food. That's what they think. So the, the best science of the day was saying, eat these foods. And uh, 
And Daniel says, the king's decided what you're supposed to eat. If you don't look as fit as the other young men, he may kill me. I mean, this is how capricious those rulers were in antiquity. You know, if they think I'm messing up with the educational program for you guys, they're going to kill me. Now, by the way, if it was a life or death matter with the king, do you think only Ashpenaz would have been killed? I mean, Daniel was literally putting his life on the line to follow healthy lifestyle practices. It's an amazing story. And why was he so particular? No doubt there were other Hebrew captives. And what do you think they said? Was Daniel bent on becoming a martyr? Well, I don't think that's likely. Even though the human evidence suggested otherwise, he was saying he was going to trust this God who at a time in my life I didn't trust. He was going to trust a Bible that I didn't trust. He had uh, a portion of the scriptures available. Of course, some of it wasn't written because uh, Daniel actually wrote one of the books of the Bible. So Daniel used temple language. He said, my body is a temple. He said, I'm not going to defile myself. And I would suggest to you, this is a powerful principle. If you realize that your body is holy, this will help you in your lifestyle journey. So I'm telling you as a physician, if you connect with this spiritual principle, and by the way, it's not just an Old Testament principle. Uh, the Apostle Paul talked about it here in 1 Corinthians. He said what? Your body is what? The temple of the Holy Spirit. And if you catch this vision, it will make a, a big difference for you. Daniel caught this vision. He asked for a 10-day trial, a 10-day trial. And, um, and that's what happens. You read the book of Daniel. Ashpenaz gives him 10 days, and Daniel only gets vegetables to eat and water to drink. Now, when I started practicing medicine, some of you, by looking at me, can tell, uh, tell that I didn't graduate just last year. Um, I've been doing this for a long time. But when I first graduated from medical school, I was actually, I had a vision for this uh, healthy lifestyle with putting patients in the hospital on uh, diets that were based on plant foods. The dietitians were worried, just like Ashpenaz was. You know, you're not going to give people enough meat and cheese. What's going to happen? Actually, all the patients did well. Uh, we actually realized today that this is the best diet. And this is what happened in Daniel 1. The ones who, got, who didn't drink the wine and didn't eat the rich foods of Babylon, they actually emerged superior from a 10-day trial. Now, I know some people read this, they say, oh, come on, what can happen in 10 days? I can tell you from the medical research, 10 days is enough to make a difference. And I've worked with these programs over the years. I've not worked at Pritikin Center, but uh, Pritikin is one of the famous uh, lifestyle programs. They run a 10-day program. And they've published remarkable results. One of the programs I worked with is uh, called Weimar. Uh, Weimar is based in Northern California. They're a new start program. Um, you can see some images from the program there. Uh, you can go to newstart.com if you want to check it out. My wife is still a physician who helps out in that clinic. She lives with me here in Fort Wayne, but she's actually back on Weimar's campus right now seeing patients. Uh, I don't work with them at all at this point, but um, they've demonstrated powerful things. This is from another uh, residential health center I worked at. And I'm not going to go into this in detail, but these are, this is data that was two weeks apart, 14 days apart. But um, when we change people's lifestyles, get them on a healthy diet, exercise, stress management, all of that, presumably things that Daniel was likely doing. He's controlling the stress by being faithful to God. He's drinking water. He's eating plant-based foods. And you can see dramatic drops and things like triglycerides and cholesterol. So look at this, the average person dropped their uh, cholesterol, or excuse me, triglycerides from around 220 down to around what, 170. Um, so that's a, a 44 point drop on average. And you can see other changes. Average person lost about 4% of their body weight in uh, just over two weeks. Many of them were overweight and that's why they came to the program. This data has been published in places. This is data from Weimar. They published in one of the uh, diabetes journals. And I could share with you other data, um, other research I've done on diabetic nerve problems. But in short programs, 10 days to two weeks to 19 days, uh, reversal or dramatic improvement in uh, diabetic nerve problems. This was something we published at a national uh, conference 
showing a 20 to 45 percent improvement in uh, diabetic nerve pain and nerve symptoms by a healthy lifestyle over the course of 19 days in this study. Okay, so you say, what does all this have to do with what we're talking about? It has to do with this point. And that is, uh, the Bible stories are set in a scientifically defensible framework. That's the book of Daniel. And John Bradshaw, in his second presentation that we'll talk about in our program June 9th, he actually looks at Daniel chapter 2 in some detail. We'll look at that. Um, but the stories are set in a scientifically defensible framework. Think of, I mean, just stop and think about this. And uh, we're going to step away from the slides. We want this to be somewhat interactive. I know... Uh, some of the logistics took a little bit longer, but I'm, I'm kind of interested in your feedback on this because over the years, people have said, um, you know, this science, does this really correlate with the Bible? Think about this. Daniel was written purportedly in 600 BC. We're going to look at that question uh, next time we're together, June 9th, to see if it's really true, if there's evidence, historical evidence that Daniel was written, the book of Daniel, written when it said it was written. And it's really important to uh, what Pastor Bradshaw covered on, um, on his second presentation. But we'll look at that. But I'm just kind of curious. What do you think? Do you think there were any cultures in 600 BC that valued a vegetarian diet? Any of you any thoughts about that? Okay, so somebody asked about Hindu uh, people. And uh, that, I think that is a good, and, and some of the Buddhist um, traditions, okay? Uh, so I was mentioning Chinese, Buddhism, Hinduism. Yeah, there are traditions that, um, that did value that. Middle Eastern traditions, I'm not aware of any. Egyptian, Babylonian, in fact, just interesting side note, the uh, Cambridge Encyclopedia of Food says that the use of pork has a, a long history of use that goes back to Babylonian times. And um, that uh, is curious because uh, that's of special significance in, um, in history. If those of you joined us late, I wanna remind you about something. I will, uh, I will show you a slide uh, one more time. I'll share it with you because we have some free resources. One of them is the free book called Evading Ebola. And um, Evading Ebola is available by um, simply sending me an email to David DeRose at hopeawakens.com. You can see that there. Um, or you can go to compasshealth.net slash Ebola. And then you can see we have a couple of other uh, free resources that are available for you. Um, one is this uh, handout on the immune system. And uh, you can get that free by going to compasshealth.net slash sanctuary. Uh, it's about 14 or 15 pages. I've gone through some of the latest information on the immune system and how there are Bible principles that are designed to enhance the immune system. And then we've also got um, David DeRose at hopeawakens.com. You can request it, The Promises of Power book by Pastor John Bradshaw. It's a little booklet. Uh, uh, got a lot of nice points that can kind of encourage you. So those are some of the uh, the free resources that we've had for you tonight. Next week, uh, the plan is that we'll try to allow for a little bit more interaction. If I have your email or you're um, subscribed to my YouTube channel, we will um, allow you to uh, keep abreast of everything that's developing. So my YouTube channel is Compass Health, uh, one word, Compass Health Space Consulting, Compass Health Space Consulting. Okay, so uh, we're going to wind up. Uh, we're going to formally end our program tonight with a word of prayer. We will dismiss you. If some of you want to stay by and you have some questions or you have some technical problems, we can help you with that. But we do want to limit the meeting to a one-hour meeting uh, each night. We will not have a meeting a week from tonight on June 2, but on June 9, we will uh, start uh, sharing some of my new videos that deal with the Methuselah factor. Um, if you came late, I'll have some uh, closing words after our prayer that will bring you up to speed. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you that we've been able to go on this uh, journey together. We pray if um, you want our ranks to increase, that you'd bring uh, additional folks to join us June 9. If this is uh, something 
that um, you want to have make a bigger difference in our lives, just continue to guide us and help us so that we can make healthy lifestyle changes and also learn practical things that will help us uh, to increase our hope and our stress management. We ask it all in the name of our loving creator. Amen. Okay, so we're officially uh, concluding the meeting, but I'm, I'm going to stay by. Uh, I know a number of you joined late, and I wanted to share with you uh, just how you can be up to speed for the meeting on June 9th. So on June 9th, uh, we'll be interacting with, uh, with content that uh, is on my YouTube channel. So hopefully, you'll have watched some of the YouTube videos called The Missing Lake. They, they average about five to seven minutes long. And we talk about how improving your blood fluidity can help you uh, be healthier. And you want to just be convinced of that. If you say, I'm already convinced, you told me enough in the 10 or 15 minutes tonight, I'm on board. Great. You don't need to watch the videos. But those videos will help you understand why we're going through some specific practical suggestions each week that can help you improve your blood fluidity. So uh, I want to remind you about that. And um, if you look on uh, the chat, if you have access to the chat, um, you can see the link there uh, early on in the chat section. If you say, hey, I, uh, I didn't get that link, I can't get the chat, I'm watching on YouTube or I'm watching on Facebook, then what you can do is simply send me an email. Uh, send an email to David D. Rose at hopeawakens.com. And uh, basically what I'll, I'll do is I'll make sure you get that link, or just go to my YouTube channel, which is Compass Health Space Consulting. The other thing that can help you uh, come up to speed, you say, I liked uh, some of the, the biblical concepts, but it sounded like there was a lot more. There is, and Pastor Bradshaw's meetings were excellent if you didn't watch them. Um, Hopeawakens.com will take you to his archives. And next week, we'll engage, we'll engage with things that he talked about in his first two presentations. So you don't have to watch anything, just come back June 9th, but if you say, I want some more of the background material, I want to be more up to speed on some of these things, you can watch that over the next couple of weeks. So uh, that's uh, what I wanted to tell you by way of background. So if you jumped on late, I should have brought you all up to speed. What I'll do now is take any questions or comments that anyone might have, anything uh, that anyone wants to share at this point. 